Welcome back to Historical Heralds, where we delve into the fascinating world of scandal and luxury. Today we have an intriguing topic that will leave you astounded. Get ready for Scandal and Luxury, the untold tales of monarch extravagance. Throughout history, monarchs have captivated our imaginations with their opulent lifestyles and extravagant tastes. From lavish palaces to priceless jewels, their lives were filled with scandalous tales that have been whispered about for centuries. In this video, we will uncover some of the most shocking and untold stories of monarch extravagance, giving you a glimpse into a world of luxury and scandal that few have ever witnessed. So why is this topic important and interesting? Well, it's not just about indulging in gossip or feeding our curiosity. By exploring these untold tales, we gain a deeper understanding of the power dynamics and excesses that existed within monarchies. It allows us to reflect on the impact of wealth and privilege on society, both then and now. In this video, we will take you on a journey through time, starting with the scandalous affairs of King Louis XIV of France. We'll reveal the hidden secrets behind his extravagant palace of Versailles and the immense cost it had on the French people. Moving forward, we'll explore the scandalous love life of Queen Victoria and her relationship with Prince Albert. Prepare to be shocked by the unconventional behavior of this royal couple and the controversies that surrounded them. But it doesn't stop there. We'll also delve into the extravagant spending habits of the Russian Tsars, including the infamous Fabergé eggs and the scandalous Rasputin affair. These stories will leave you in awe of the excesses that were indulged in by the Russian monarchy. Finally, we'll uncover the scandalous tales of modern-day monarchies, from the controversies surrounding the British royal family to the extravagant lifestyles of Middle Eastern monarchs. Prepare to be amazed by the tales of luxury and scandal that continue to shape our world today. So, if you're ready to dive into a world of scandal and luxury, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. You won't want to miss out on the untold tales of monarch extravagance that we have in store for you. By the 1660s, Louis XIV believed that his domestic situation had grown spectacularly dull. Incidents of gross infidelity between the king and the queen had become scandalously public, and Louis was eager to spice things up. Marie Therese of Spain, the Queen of France, was completely devoted to her husband and remained inflamed with desperate adultery since the day they met. Desperate, Louis groomed two mistresses to take her from him. Louis thought these mistresses might bring the country to the brink of civil war. But true to form, the stoic French people kept still while the Sun King and his paramours basked arrogantly under the sun they shared. He even moved his favorite mistress into the suite immediately above her own, so that the unfortunate queen could hear all the sounds of her husband's pleasure. These mistresses represented two sides of a morbidly debauched butch gallant dichotomy, both competing for Louis's affections. Even Louis believed that one Frenchman compared to the worst Roman emperor had some growing up to do. The Duchesse de la Vallière vied for his monarch's favors by promoting her every apparent virtue, she was always the blushing virgin with braided hair running along the sides of Paris's most fervent patriarch, tugging modestly at her simple shift, giggling nervously through her slightly rounded, wide-eyed saucer face while she glanced tenderly at the standing king's seated visage. His bold yet virtuous mistress spread word to the nervous people who walked before them that the father of the church would save them all. At that very instant, beautiful and humble La Valliere, in her mortal defiance to the Augustine canon, would do the same. Her face was a bit fuller and rounder, more childlike where it should have been hollow, while the people gawked at the light floating behind the long rows of squalid tenements beside them. La Valliere knew what she was doing. Members of royal families around the world are known for their scandalous spending habits. As a result, the majority of monarchs or their head of states are among the wealthiest in the world. Monarchs can live a life of opulence thanks to their principality's resources such as oil or diamonds or taxpayers throughout their states. Fortunes come from their salaries which vary from generation to generation. The living costs of these royals are typically paid for by the state, although there are some exceptions. In Monaco, Prince Albert, the richest monarch in the world, pays almost E.R. 390,000 each year to run the country, a job he shares with his family members, the Grimaldi clan, who have long been associated with terrorism. 
Their palaces, yachts, refineries and grandparents of yachts are considered the second most expensive in the world. Spending on the other extravagant life of the prince totals more than ER 23 million, almost entirely due to his suitable marriage. Scandal and luxury have come to dominate the world of royal families. After all, shouldn't these people be responsible, conserve public funds and set an example by being modest? Generally, the pockets of any head of state are also capable of organizing visits to glamorous international charities or resorting to a state land trust by hiding some of their spending from the paid. However, some royals remain eager to invent and have as indulgent of a life as possible while concealing some of their spending with the treasury thanks to the system in place in their country. A collection started by Tsar Alexander III to impress and woo his embittered empress consort-to-be, it was then expanded with fervor by his son Nicholas II, desperately attempting to return his now bitter wife's affection and to keep with the queen's newly acquired eye for the fashionable. Fashion wasn't all that wowed the Russian queen when she was young and indeed England was a choice destination of hers and two of her sisters, attending many high society functions. Both Alexandra's actual affection and admiration of the Queen may also have been strongly influenced by a shared sense of artistic beauty and material wealth. Look to the magnificent Fabergé eggs, believed to have been specifically for Alexandra, were 13 of the 50 or so made by Carl Fabergé. They are not only exquisite ornaments of gold, silver, platinum, enamel, diamond, who regularly won prizes at international exhibitions, but they are extraordinary individualistic objects. Each one was an Easter gift for the Russian Tsars Alexander III and Nicholas II to their wives and mothers from 1885 to 1916 and today, depending on their provenance and ornamentation, some individually valued between 20 million to 50 million pounds. It is hardly surprising that these small monsters represented such outrageously high valuations, particularly as this conflation of eggs with wealth were such emotional investments. Knowing how long it takes for an egg to hatch and similarly, years of finicky artistry had gone into the many each took to be labelled perfect. Every step of their construction from the thousands upon thousands of diamonds during the winter of 1907 was an artist to the employment of a former court miniature painter, Victor Arna was for the enamelling of the first hen egg. One of the most scandalous events involving the Romanovs occurred at Tsarina Teodros's crowned 1881-D-1891 time, when without her formal consent the Royal Mint presented a 25-ruble gold coin to her intimate calling herself her spiritual advisor, Grigor Rasputin, a mannerless native Siberian peasant and charlatan who arrived at Petersburg at the monkhood age, had tuberculosis and spent a few years in a monastery hospital. As a miraculous healer, he was promoted by his patrons to such an extent that sick people were rushing to him from as far as Germany, England and the USA. Rasputin used to aggressively demonstrate his manner of execution and spread rumors of having a special relationship with full, eternal, octogenarian dowager Empress Maria. The scandal surrounding precisely him made in time, the monarchy seemed to some unworthy or in need of spiritual relaxation altogether, giving impetus to the February Revolution of 1917. Members of the Ministerial Council ordered Rasputin the most chic cloth and plums. Ladies of the court lavished him with diamonds and rubies. A young officer also fell for the cunning trickster. But when he found out why his fiancée never left Rasputin, he shot Rasputin in the stomach, not only in fear for his fiancée's soul and dignity, but also of his own honor and sanity. Although the wound was nothing serious, yet well-wishers' talent reminded to suggest the healer repatriation to his native village in Siberia, and the caretaker of the throne, Mikhail Rodsyanko, warned His Majesty that Rasputin was bad for the war prestige of the branch of the Romanov family in power. Scandalous people were plenty in the history of the Romanovs. Some managed to disguise the shame of expelled as descendants from the dynasty, some cultivated honor and dignity to themselves. Happily, six months after the letters, on the 11th of February 1840, Queen Victoria married at the Chapel Royal of St. James's Palace. With any nudges to her back which would come few and far, she overcompensated with a swing which dragged the Archbishop's ring over her knuckle, cutting her finger in the process. It came from causing Albert to waste all that time. 
also troublesome was the brigand impersonation for the presentation of St. George's Chapel on 10 years for having love and obedience after the look, their ABC were reduced to a standing room. Once all welcome pageantry was passed, their honeymoon to Windsor and the Isle of Wight began. Victoria found herself in a love-denuded marriage before it had really begun. Letter-writing might be money-spinning for the postal service, 600,000 franc letters and 800,000 stamps a year, but letters meant nothing to a husband far from a wife when one had but to share time and space to feel true intimacy. Queen Victoria's love life led her subjects to think more commercially about sentimentality. Prolific letter writing was one's only means of personal contact with their beloved, and hence Henry Cole, superintendent of the government's mills, found a way to commodify a market in emotions 15 years before he began the introduction of the first postage stamp. By 1836, reading public had become insistent upon a real love story, a Scotch god without real flesh and blood, and a child too should never fall in love or act until at least 16, especially with a boring professorial type. Furthermore, the story must be the love story of a man at least 40. Victoria may not yet have realized it, but her interest in Albert was a political liability. There were many noble descendants of King George III to choose from, all of equal merit. If Ernst or Alexander or George didn't wish to marry, surely Leopold or the Prussian lieutenant will stand in as his proxies. Victoria fell for the cousin over the child. Their meeting of 1839 changed Victoria from an 18-year-old girl to a woman of 19, so much so, a woman who one walked with a gait that was a little painful to the sovereign who received the fealty of millions. Lady Littleton, who observed her closely during this period, noted that conversing with the young man who had now become partially responsible for her affairs, she hears rather than listen and does not join in the conversation. In private, however, she privately turns to him as to a kind of oracle, as she considered him far superior in intellect to herself. Prince Albert and Victoria were first cousins. Their relationship was a product of their close kinship and their childhood spent together. From the time Victoria was five years old, they resided under the same household. When Albert first arrived in England to meet Victoria, in his own words, Victoria had been waiting for her cousin with biblical patience and interest, as always can now go beyond child ways. The first meeting was a great success. Albert was impressed by Victoria's intelligence, to the point that he concluded one day she will make an excellent queen. Soon he began to admire her womanly attributes as well. Prince Albert's diary referred to Victoria as an uncontrolled and headstrong young girl who never altered her opinions on certain subjects and can exhibit an almost masculine force. Victoria was immediately impressed by Albert and his fine bearing. She began to miss his company when he wasn't around. By the 18th of October, however, as Albert made another visit to Windsor Castle, it was evident that Victoria has fallen for her cousin. In the 1800s and early 1900s, the most scandalous publications were two newspapers, both based in Britain and dedicated to providing to the public in melodramatic detail the misadventures of royals and other public figures. The Weekly Dispatch, published from 1801 to 1905, was acknowledged to be the newspaper in the world that devoted the strictest attention to personal biography. At a time when reliable news sources were few and far between, this paper thrived on the insatiable appetite of Britons who wished to be kept informed not only about the doings of kings, queens and other potentates, but concerning their friends, habits, faults and various peccadilloes. No one seemed to suspect that the disgruntled housekeeper or footman who supplied a salacious morsel with names carefully omitted for the Verstehen of the British population should have credibility questioned. People, it seems, who were genuinely free from scandal had dubious or hateful ones born about them. The instructive for editorial staff of the Weekly Dispatch for 1905 offered a bundle of advice on how to survive in the business of know-how. The public always loved lists of any kind, for both amusement and astonishment. Members of royalty are like celebrities in this day and age with countless tabloids and paparazzi dedicated to following their every move in the hopes of catching the next big scandal. In the past, things were not very different. The professional blabbermouths may have had a different title and the technology may not have been as advanced, but nonetheless, they prospered just as well. 
When it comes to commoners, people are more forgiving than when it concerns a count or a king. To give consequence to nearly every action of public men, Joseph Addison once said, is as much a part of the duty of our present weekly historians as it is of the daily. In fact, he continued, such a minuteness is extremely necessary for the right understanding of characters. A word, a look, a gesture may be significant. These are subject to the consideration of such as are curious in their observations and inquiries. All the capers large and minuscule that transpired in those earlier houses in the trees, especially ones which took place during the eras of social progress, when oppressive social superiors were finally losing their power, are replete with mounting energy that lends substance to suspicions of massive implosions. There would seem to be no rest for the weary. The continuing royalty public conflict is presently incarnated in the new question of who the legitimate monarchs are. Defenses of immemorial monarchical family lines must now be mounted against new impostors, many of whom appear to come from nowhere. What can they claim these mountebanks of modernity, while their families have been taking trips to Bali and comparing girls and bangles on the porch they've left in their wake, a clumsy series of frauds and practical jokes on the erstwhile career men? Curtains for the swells, trumpet minds that have sometimes no more than a half-baked theory behind them. But if the modern realists have their way, the turbulent monarchs appear to be in for a nice big freeze to death on the near horizon. Contemplez-vous the magnifying rides of the loungers. In recent years, significantly fewer people have followed the antics of modern-day members of the world's remaining monarchies. Admittedly, many of the international events and royal splurges described in the following chapters are quite dated. Yet telling them still seems worthwhile. To some, the idea of living off the people at an exuberant standard of luxury is welcome news. After all, pauperizing historied palaces and exterminating wild game might not rank on most people's famine solutions list. One danger, of course, is that the existence of one-time and still international exemplars of pillar of fine living practices may inspire them elsewhere. Revelations of palace pomposity are newsworthy even today, in the event that a royally privileged future is desired by an ever hungrier and malnourished world. We keep watching. Time continues with its warpings. These arguments opened a debate and a reflection on the use of the tax money by the living and the expenses allowed to the heads of the royal families. In an international panorama two years ago, the last debate was held in the Swedish parliament about the royal family's waste of money on luxury trips, more and more questioned by the press as it is being on behalf of the common people paid in every case scenario. Without having to go far, this Spanish town has often debated on the issue of the cost of its monarchs demanded the suppression of the king's total expense from the budget and criticized some of the habits of the creature. Since becoming a republic in 2002, there has been an interest in the lifestyle of the princes known as Evo and Letitia, demanding that they not benefit from the public coffers or with charitable gestures abdicate the use of them. Despite opinions and emerging cases, the royal family is still a widely recognized symbol of Great Britain. It is no secret that members of monarchies live luxurious lives, but the controversy comes when these expenses are paid for by taxpayers. Although they indeed are national symbols and icons of the state, everyone seems to have their own particular opinion in this regard. According to a poll conducted in a reputable British daily, 68% of those surveyed were in favor of financial transparency on the part of the royals as well as greater demand on them. It was the President of the Republic, Senor da Silva, who said in his day that he did not understand how the English, home to one of the richest monarchies in the world, could accept that the taxes of the British people would serve to maintain it. In the case of King Fowlard, the work hours are beyond encouragement. The seventh ruler of Bahrain sleeps for two hours every day and his declaration of intent states that he must give half the salary as the head of the state to orphans and widows. The king of Bahrain's lifestyle reminds everyone of a coin has two sides idiom. Still, it is unknown how large the king's fortune is. The point of attraction of his lifestyle is transparency. One reason why the lack of disclosure of a monarch's accounts is so remarkable is a constant process of democratization. Active members of the civil society are aware of their power as an influential intermediary between the government and the nation. 
They understand that the role of a monarchy in a developed state is problematic. The privileges of royal family members are limited and the government must take into account the voice and opinion of the nation. The Gulf monarch's extravagant lifestyle is an open secret. Although authoritarian, their states enjoy an abundance of wealth thanks to their enormous reserves of oil and natural gas. In recent times, international observers have been intrigued by the lavishness of the monarchs. Countless articles and discussions dedicated to the materialism of the Gulf elite have been published. Definitely, the level of waste that is attributed to the monarchs is impressive, but it is the absence of socio-economic reforms instead of an individual's wealth that deserves attention. Using the example of European monarchs, it is visible that the life of a politically neutral royal family member is, in the words of famous Austrian historian Stefan Zweig, shaped by phantasmagoria of empty absurdities. But in other cases, the fresh air of a new day brings a monarch opportunity to be involved in important national and international questions. Nevertheless, she, he cannot realize these opportunities as she wants. Politicians, with their often formal and high levels of knowledge and footing, ensure that the monarch avoids deep involvement in public life. Besides, the day-to-day -day obligations of a royal family member are not limited to shaking hands with people. The royal has to attend charity events. The narrative of monarchy is one of paradoxes, extravagance amidst calls for modesty, personal scandals juxtaposed with public roles, and the evolving relationship between monarchies and the people they rule. As the world changes, so too does the face of monarchy, constantly adapting to new challenges and scrutiny in an era where transparency and accountability increasingly dictate legitimacy. Thank you for joining us today. Remember to like this video if you enjoyed it and leave a comment below with your thoughts on these scandalous stories. Stay tuned for more captivating content on our channel. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the fascinating world of scandal and luxury.